Assalamu alaikum and hello and welcome to everyone. My name is Shujaa Imran and in this new video, I'll be explaining some five rule of thumb tips that every pilot should know and should know by heart. So these are some quick formulas and some quick calculations that will allow you to speed up some time in the cockpit and allow you to save some time doing those difficult mental math calculations. I know a lot of pilots can find it hard to do maths mentally and especially given the fact that some of the calculations in aviation can be very difficult but these small formulas and small tips to calculate some major issues in the cockpit can help you during your flying and uh, all of your navigation and any circuit flight. So in the rule of thumb tips, the first one that we have is the 1 in 60 rule. Now this rule basically states that for every 60 nautical miles you travel, if you are traveling 1 degree off from your path, you will end up 1 nautical mile off your path after those 60 nautical miles. Now this rule, you might have heard it a lot, it has a lot of applications, especially in your general navigations. Uh, because in your navigation flying, you need to know how distance off track or on track you are and you need to calculate how to get back on your path. Now we'll take a quick example for this. Let's say you're going from A to B. Now your distance for the total distance is 80 nautical miles. Now let's say that after flying 20 nautical miles, you should have been here, but you end up here. Now you all, you find out after 20 nautical miles that you are four nautical miles off your track. So the hypothetical situation is that you were traveling from A to B and uh, instead of going straight, you have ended up four nautical miles off your track. Now at this point over here, after 20 nautical miles, you need to know how to get back on your track because essentially you need to reach B. Now the quickest way to find your new heading or your new um, track in order to get back on track is to use the 1 in 60 rule. Now there are two formulas over here that you need to remember. First thing you need to calculate is how to get back on track. That means how to fly parallel to your heading. So in this case, the first formula that we will use is, uh, let's calculate your, the first formula is you take your distance off track, your DOT, you divide it by your distance along track, that means the distance you have traveled and you multiply it into 60. So if we use the same formula, distance off track, we are 4 nautical miles off our track. We have traveled 20 nautical miles along our track and we multiply that into 60. Now if you um, would like to use a calculator for this, go ahead. But easily if you just solve this out, this becomes 1, this becomes 5, 65, this becomes 12. So 12 degrees. Now using those 12 degrees, what you will do is, you will be, if you fly 12 degrees, and we'll be flying right because we're all the way to the left. So if we fly 12 degrees, you will be flying straight. But what we need to calculate is how to come back onto P. So the second formula that we will use here is distance of track over distance to go into 60. So remember I told you that the entire distance was 80 nautical miles. So we'll do the same four over so 80 minus 20 is 60, 4 over 60 into 60 is equal to the same calculations. 60 will be cut off with 60 and you get 4 degrees. So the end, the total result that you need to fly is this plus this. So we have 12 degrees plus 4 degrees is equal to 16 degrees. So essentially to get to your destination, which is B, you need to fly 16 degrees to your right. So that is the most common and easy application of the 1 in 60 rule. So the second rule of thumb is how to calculate your rate of descent on a 3 degree glide slope or 3 degree glide path. So um, basically a 3 degree glide path is the most common that is used in any approach, be it an ILS approach, be it a VORDME approach or an RMP approach. The most common rate of descent you will find on any approach chart is a 3 degree glide path. Now to calculate this 3 degree glide path, basically a 3 degree glide path equals to a 5% rate of descent. 
So to calculate your rate of ascent on a 3 degree glide slope, what you do is you simply you take your ground speed, which you'll get using different methods. If you know the wind or you have a G1000 in front of you, you get your ground speed in front. So take your ground speed and just multiply it into five and you'll get your rate of descent on a three degree glide path. So that's the most easiest way to do that. And remember, it's not your task. It's not your true airspeed, not your indicated airspeed, but actually you need your ground speed and you multiply it into five and you'll get your rate of descent that you need to maintain on the approach to maintain that glide path and glide slope actively. Okay, so the third rule of thumb that a lot of people have been asking me again and again is how do you calculate your top of descent and where you need to descend from? Now, if you're in an advanced jet, most probably you'll get this automatically on your navigation display or your multifunction display. Uh, in the Airbus, in the Boeing aircraft, it comes automatically. In aircraft such as the Diamond DA42, you can enter it in by um, the VNAV profile. But what to do if you need to calculate it manually, such as in a Cessna or an Archer or an Arrow or whatever. So basically what you do, there are two formulas for this. One is a bit lengthier in which it involves having your height that you need to lose, your time, you find that time out to get to the fix and you divide it and then you'll get your rate of descent. But what I'm going to teach you is another very easy trick in order to get your rate of descent. So what we'll do is, we'll, you have to first see what's your current altitude. So let's say I'm maintaining a current altitude of 8,000 feet. And my altitude which I need to reach is, um, let's say 2,000 feet. So target altitude is equal to 2,000 feet. So easily we can see there that we need to lose approximately 6,000 feet. So we have the 6,000 feet that we have to use automatically just erase all the zeros. So you are, you are left by 6 and let's multiply 6 into 3 that gives you 18. So basically you need to start your descent 18 nautical miles away from the airfield or the target fix where you need to reach 2,000 feet. Now always remember this 18 nautical mile equals to a rate of descent at again a 3 degree glide path. So basically if you want to find your rate of descent, you just multiply your ground speed again into 5 and you'll get your rate of descent. Now this is an approximate figure remember, I, I like to add a bit of a buffer so I usually add if I'm flying Cessna 172, I add a, at least 2 nautical miles just to keep a buffer instead if I need to level off or if I have some other conflict changes that I need to do. I just add those two nautical miles. So, But essentially this figure gives you a very quick assessment of how quickly you need to descend and how far you need to descend away from the airfield just to reach your target altitude. If you want to find the longer way to do it, you can do that by just finding the height you need to lose, the time it will take you to get to that fix, that will give you the distance and if you divide the height by the time that will give you your rate of descent that you need to maintain during that descent. Okay, so for the fourth rule of thumb, what we'll be doing is we'll be learning how to calculate a crosswind component on approach for when you're coming into land. So um, as a pilot, you should know what is the crosswind component of any runway and you should know how to easily calculate this because if you have a major crosswind, obviously that's going to affect your landing and that might result in a bounce landing or an unsafe landing. So to calculate the um, crosswind component, it's a really, really easy formula. So first let's take an example, we're landing on runway, let's say 28 left and we have a runway heading of 280 degrees. Now the wind reported by the tower is let's say 310 degrees at 15 knots. Okay, so now over here what we need to find is what is our crosswind component of this wind. Now if you have a flight computer you can do this quickly on the wheel or if you have a scientific calculator you can also use the formula for that. Um, but what we're going to do is learn how to do this mentally in our heads. So let's take the relative bearing first. So what a relative bearing is, it's basically the, uh, the degrees between the wind and the runway heading. So let's say our relative bearing today is 310 minus 280. That gives us a relative bearing of 030 degrees. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to take this figure of 30 degrees, we're going to lose the zero and we're going to divide that by six. Now three over six is also equal to half, which is equal to one over two. Now, whatever factor this comes out to be, 
is basically you just multiply that into your wind component and you get your cross wind component. So for example, now we know that three over six is half, it's 0 0.5 or one over two. One over two into 15 gives us seven and a half knots. So our crosswind component basically on this specific approach is let's round it off, it's eight knots. So that's how you just quickly calculate your crosswind component. Remember, this is only effective, this rule of the sixth is this is known as the sixth rule because basically you take your relative bearing and you divide it by six. The rule of sixth is only applicable to winds with a relative bearing of 60 degrees or less. If the wind is greater than 60 degrees of your runway heading, you take the entire component. So for example, if the winds reported, uh, let's say the wind reported was 350 degrees at 10 knots. Now you see 350 and 280, the relative bearing is 70. So in this case, we take the entire crosswind component of 10 knots. We don't use this calculation. But that's just an easy way to calculate the crosswind component on your approach. I hope you're not tired yet. The last rule of thumb for this video is how to calculate your density altitude. Now, a lot of people are confused what is a density altitude in uh, actual. So basically, a density altitude is the altitude that you are flying at or going to take off or going to land, uh, which is corrected for both your Q and H or your pressure and both your temperature as well. So it's corrected for both the pressure and the temperature. Now, this value of your density altitude is very important when you're taking in consideration your performance calculations because depending on what airport you're taking off and what conditions you're taking off in it can result in you being able to take off with a greater weight a less weight or etc so defining your density altitude is very important and a concept that every pilot should know now obviously there are also advanced methods to calculate this but i'm just going to give you a quick formula that you should be remembering so basically for your density altitude your density altitude I'm just going to represent that by ALT is equal to your pressure altitude. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, plus 120 into your outside air temperature minus your ISA temperature. It may sound a bit complicated. It may sound a bit difficult to remember. That's why I just uh, I recommended going it going through it again and again. But your density altitude again is equal to your pressure altitude plus 120 into your outside air temperature minus your ISA temperature. Now, what is your pressure altitude? Your pressure altitude is the altitude which is set on your altimeter when you set 1013 or 29 or small 92 on the um, scale. So basically, it's just the standard uh, pressure and the altitude it indicates. So for example, let's just do a quick example. My airport is at 700 feet, okay, MSL. Now, the Q and H on one specific day at my airport is 1005. Let's just take an example. I'm not doing any proper calculations. Now, when I sit into the cockpit or when I have an altimeter in front of me, I set 1013 on the scale. Remember, 1013 is our standard pressure. So when I set 1013, I should be getting an indication of 940 feet. And again, this is just a rough calculation. Um, so when I'm getting an indication of 940 feet, this is my pressure altitude, whereas this was my actual mean sea level of the elevation. But now this 940 altitude will be inserted into my formula. And let's say for the same thing, the temperature on this specific day is 35 degrees Celsius. So it's a very hot day. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to just put all these values into the formula. So 120 into 35 minus. Um, now, the ISA temperature, you must know, is 15 degrees Celsius at sea level. Um, since we are approximately 1,000 feet, let's round it off. So it should be 14 degrees. So let's enter in 14 over here. And if we just do the calculations, you get a figure. Let's use our calculator for this, because this is a bit of a complicated 
formula. So 35 minus 14, this gives us 21. Now I'm going to do this opposite since I don't have space below. Um, 21 into 120 is equal to 2520 and plus 940. So this whole figure is equal to 2520. Now let's just clean this up a bit. Okay, we'll add it here. So 940 plus 120 into 21 is equal to density altitude. 940 plus 2520 is equal to density altitude. Our density altitude equals out to be 93460. So let's do that in red. Density altitude is equal to 3460 feet. So you can see how much of a difference there is. Your actual field elevation was 700 feet, but your density altitude due to the low pressure and the high temperature is 3460 feet. So this figure, it will be used in your performance calculations whenever you are asked to um, use the density altitude. So that was all for these five rule of thumbs for today. I hope you had um, you understood them actually. Now, when you use them in practice, obviously you'll get a more you'll get more hang of it. But these are some formulas and some calculations that you should know by heart, and again, why they're known as a rule of thumb. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, for more, be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and then see you soon in a future video. Thank you. Bye bye. Love this.